is love. I know God is love and therefore God operates in love all the time. He never is nothing other than love. And I know people's views of him. Well, he's just and he's holy. Of course he is. But that means justice and holiness are love expressed and outworked. They're not, they're not different. You know, and we have this two two versions of God when we look at, well, the God who seemed to be operating in the Old Testament as opposed to when Jesus came to reveal who God was in the new. And people are still operating in a mixture of those two faced gods. Well, God isn't. God has always been love. He's never, ever been anything different. And he wasn't operating anything different in the New Test Old Testament as he was in the New. It's just people viewed him differently. They didn't know him and therefore they viewed him and described him out of their lack of knowledge of him through their own religious mindset of who they created God to be because they rejected a relationship with him and therefore were describing him from a distance through their own mindsets and belief systems about him doesn't define him we have never defined god through our theology and our beliefs or doctrines god is not definable by us he is god well i i am um, i've been listening to russell brand and he's changed so much my gosh um he was uh, baptized I, I think in the thames river in the spring and now on his pod well before he was always about love but but now he's he's recognizing Jesus Christ as his savior on his podcast. He's talking about that, and then he's he's actually um, host, having Bible studies on his podcast, and you can tell he's really hungry for the Lord. So, and he and he's got quite a following. So so um, you know, and and he's been a, an addict and been and and he's you know recognized how wild his life was before so i uh, just um i i seem to to see that there's lots more people actually coming out now that mm. are um famous or whatever and or, or that are actually stating that that you know they've been awakened to the lord yeah well i i i guess it, it's what you'd expect if there's an awakening going on to love and um, that God is at work to try and unveil who he is. Hopefully none of these guys will get drawn into the religious mindsets of, you know, the stuff that we've been set free from. We don't want them getting drawn into that. So it would be worth, you know, legislating for protection around them. A, from that religious stuff that they could get drawn into but also be from those that want to discredit them and who would bring out their past and the other things that they have done in the past which obviously is part of the reason why they were looking for a solution in their life in the first place but people can discredit people i know russell brand has, has had a lot of people coming out from his past behavior um, from years ago. And it's really difficult when God's forgiveness and grace and mercy are such that he's wiped that slate clean, whereas actually in the world, people don't show mercy like that. And there's no, seemingly, there's no statute of limitations on people's past discretions, which I'm not saying we should just ignore them, but ultimately we need to see and treat people in, in love and by forgiving them so that we let we let that go as well and i think it's important for people in the public eye that are protected and we do legislate for their protection because of course god can use them powerfully um, in lots of different circles to see hey this life has been transformed and, and i'm all for that but obviously celebrity has its consequences and you know, no doubt people will look to undermine anything that he's doing um, by bringing up and dragging up his past, um, you know, and that's just life in this sort of celebrity age um, in that way. But it's great. You know, it's really good that, you know, people are discovering 
you know, God, and hopefully they'll discover the two God and not just the sort of God they may have been sold. Um, and I'm sure God will reveal himself to someone who's hungry and searching for truth and reality, you know. Um, but it's important that we're Christians don't get on the bandwagon of condemnation for his past indiscretions to which all of us have them so you know um you know and i there'll be those who are suspicious yeah i've heard, heard people saying oh it can't be true and stuff like that about him and and that yeah. and then actually he was on the, uh, an interview with tucker carlson and um tucker carlson asked him to pray and he got so excited and got down down <laughs> on his knees and was praying <laughs> so okay. it was it was nice yeah uh, unfortunately i don't know who's around him uh hopefully people who can ground him in relationship rather than getting him into you know religion and you know, yeah, obviously we you don't have to get on your knees and pray, do you? In a sense, but you know, uh, and it might be cute from one perspective that he, but you want him to have the sort of maintain the innocence of a relationship and not get drawn into stuff and not be used. You know, there are a lot of Christians out there who will use celebrities and put them on the oh wow and and you know and expose them to issues. Um, which they shouldn't have to face, you know, you know, why should they be paraded as a celebrity Christian, which can put them under a lot of pressure and um, is, is not something I would want to do to people. Now, let God use them in the way that God wants to use them rather than some, you know, I don't know who might do it, but, you know, usually some TV celebrity or whatever else or some Christian TV guy will get them on board and then expose them to lots of people. And and they may not be ready to handle that. You know, give them some time to find their feet with God and to learn, you know, about God's love without the pressure of having to perform and be paraded. And it was it was always the case. I mean, in the past, when we saw people who were saved from drugs churches wanted them around to give them to give their testimony you okay. know and they sort of fed on on that and the sort of celebrity of it and and that fed into their needs for acceptance um which often sort of came crashing down if they weren't carefully protected you know so parading them around churches doing their testimony didn't really do them any good looking back better they gave okay share your testimony in 12 months time when you are you know more mature and you know you're not subject maybe to the need for people's approval and everything else and you know we had probably three or four really high profile drug addicts who were saved genuinely saved but were under a huge lot of pressure and people you know used them um and and not all of them made it you know some of them you know and some of them years later struggled you know um you know so it's one of those things that you want you want people to have the space to find their own relationship with god and not be paraded but it is one of those things someone's in the public eye one way or another you know is a risk for those people and hopefully you know, they'll discover and flow with God uh, in the future. And I'm sure God will use that. Yeah. And so it is good. And I, and I would expect lots of more people to have found God who are not yes, necessarily sharing it publicly. And I think that might be wise for some people to keep it to themselves. Not that they're afraid or not they're ashamed of it, but it's just wisdom to enable them to have the space to grow and mature you know um, and later on then when they're when they've got a solid testimony of you know more wisdom and maturity then then there's the ability for them to to share that with the history of it 
you know, and say, yeah, I've, I've worked this through over the last few years without being in the public eye. You know, and I think that's that's wiser for some people, you know, to do. Anyway. Mike said, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on, carry on. Uh, you said uh, we have to legislate into his, for his protection and into his life. As yeah. I understand it, uh, legislation is like the outworking of God's plan in your life. Do I understand that correct? Well, legislation is the authority we have to administrate God's heart. Okay. And therefore, in someone's life, therefore, yes, we would be administrating for God. But we need ma a mandate to do it. I'm not saying we could just go away and do everything for everyone. But if we have a heart and compassion for people, we can certainly ask God, do I have permission to legislate for this guy's protection or for this guy's blessing? You know, and in general, we know that's the heart of God. So, you know, for me, it would be no problem thinking, yeah, this is the sort of guy that needs to be in our heart and that we're covering him in God's love and wanting the best for him, you know, and, and therefore, you know, but there may be specifics where I would need God's permission and authority to do, to do something because I can't just assume that I can interfere in someone's life. You know what I mean? Um, even if it's with the best intentions and with the best desires for their protection. But sometimes, you know, people need to be shielded. And so I would legislate perhaps that people wouldn't see it. You know, not everyone and the wrong people wouldn't see it. And he wouldn't be exposed to pressure and, and undue attention that can take him off. Because celebrities like celebrity. You know, I mean, that's why they're celebrities, you know, <laughs> not all of them cope with it very well. But then you become a Christian celebrity. And, I, and I'm and i just a little bit wary of that, you know, when people may not be able to handle that, um, you know. Um, but definitely something that I think is going to happen more. And we should be thinking, well, what can we do to protect people and keep them safe um in in that initial period where you know they can be susceptible and are, and are not necessarily wise to everything at that point but it's good news to hear it you know i'm, I'm not saying oh i wouldn't would rather it wouldn't happen but i would just want you know him to you know to to have the time to grow in it and hopefully that god will place around in people who are wise and that people who can ground him into God's love and not get into the performance of needing to, you know, behave in a certain way or do certain things. But yeah, if I was looking to have legislation, like let's say I do have authority in my own family or something like that, I would look to legislate that they would find their own identity and destiny in God and no, I wouldn't be interfering with that. I would be looking to support it and encourage it and enhance it. But, you know, you can't make people do things you want them to do or even make the right choices in life. But you can certainly um, make declarations and decrees that can help them um, to find that path in their own, own life and to find God's plan and purpose for their life and their own identity in it. You know, most people don't really know who they really are and god wants to reveal it but it can only be revealed in relationship you can't intellectually try and figure it out or understand it you have to experience it and it has to be revealed in the face-to-face -face revealing of intimacy with god you know that's where we find where we are when we look at him yeah. so relationship is absolutely the key in the initial stages of any person in their journey with God is to find the unconditional love of God and to find that place where they're restored and they begin to realize who they really are by really understanding who God is by experience and not intellectual understanding. You know, the intellectual side of we can learn this and we can understand it and we can read books about it and we can, you know, it's, it's gotta be found relationally. Um, and that only comes as an individual themselves learns to discover, you know, the truth. Um, yeah. 
Uh, do you look, um, I remember the earlier um, series when you, when you were te teaching it, uh, do you look at legislation any differently after all your, the experiences that you had with the father? Um, yeah, I mean, in a sense, we learn and we mature and we grow in our identity and authority and position and how we use it. So the techniques that I would have taught how to make a law, how to establish legislation, I'm not saying that those things aren't valid. They are. But they become part of who you are, not techniques. And I think it isn't like, here's the formula of how we legislate. It's got to be relational out of the father's heart. Therefore, it has to be established in his heart for us to outwork his heart through the governmental positions that we carry through our sonship identity. And I would say I would put much more of an emphasis on our sonship and our identity in sonship that gives us the authority to legislate than just telling people how you can go and make legislation and get it accepted in different courts of heaven. You know, all of that is valid, but it's easier to do that from a position of, of knowing who we are than just feeling I can go and do it, you know, and the temptation in just teaching people how to do it, they may not be mature enough to be able to do it out of God's heart. And therefore they may legislate out of their own heart or legislate out of their own understanding. And they start doing things which can be manipulative, you know, or with a, a lack of understanding of God's love. So I think some people that I came across who were legislating yeah back in 2014 or 15 when i first started to travel i found that i was quite shocked by the lack of love in their legislation and it seemed to be more judgment than real legislation and so they thought they were using the courts of heaven to bring god's judgment onto people well you know that's just a sign of immaturity um and really they weren't operating in a heavenly court if they thought they were getting authority to judge somebody so where were they operating maybe in their own mind you know out of their own understanding so the more we mature i think the more we operate in love and i would definitely focus legislation is it is an outworking of god's heart in love it is not using some legislative governmental thing to change people or to make people do this and i don't like the well i'm going to change this governmental thing on earth because i've got greater authority in heaven and i'm gonna i i find a lot of that lacks love and it seems to judge and condemn people you know people in government around the world are operating mostly out of the level of I, understanding they have i don't think most people are trying to do things wrongly or things and so they're operating out of their own conscience now they we might not agree with them but to sort of do this spiritual warfare type well i'm going to legislate against them and i'm going to get them removed from office and i'm going to well if God isn't behind that, then you're doing it out of a judgment. And I and I would be very careful when I hear what people say they have done in a governmental way. And I take some of it with a pinch of salt because it doesn't feel that it's God's heart to do it that way. And I'm never going to come against somebody and undermine their character or assassinate their character or come out publicly against them even if i don't like the way they do things god still loves them and you know and i look at that in a political sense and it's like of course there are, there are political people around the world and they doing things that i don't like and you could say in russia or putin doing what he does but he's still a child of god so I've got to be very careful about how I handle 
what I would do in a situation legislatively for Ukraine. And I know some people are like, let's take Putin out, you know, and let's get rid of him. And, 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 and you know, that's not how God does things. There may be consequences of what he does that may well, he may reap what he sowed. But ultimately, God still loves him and God wants him to know the truth of who he is as a son of God. And therefore, probably if he knew that, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing now. You know, but ultimately, we've got to be careful about how we come. We don't come in the same spirit as someone's operating in. We need to come in the opposite spirit to show that we're coming in, in love and not condemnation and judgment. Now, of course, I'm not going to accept what he's doing as something good because it absolutely isn't. And it's a, probably a reflection of his own brokenness and need for legacy and affirmation and all of that. But we've got to be careful that we don't overstep and come from a judgmental position. And what I've seen in what I would say the classic spiritual warfare dynamic is often very judgmental and coming out of where well, we're going to come against these people you know and i and i wouldn't do that and i don't like that way of looking at it you know do let's focus on the positive of seeing god's heart brought into fulfillment through legislation rather than always the negative we're trying to stop this and we're trying to stop that and we're trying to well if we bring about god's heart and purpose the, the rest of it will fall away eventually because more and more people will abandon that, you know. So I want to I want to see it as a, a a positive. You know, let's look at the solution and not always the problem. You know, and and I feel legislation should always be positive in love, not negative in judgment and out of anger or out of frustration. You know, and therefore we need God's heart. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And when he came and challenged the Pharisees, he wasn't against them. He wanted them. He wanted to gather them. It says like chicks under the hen's wing, you know, but they wouldn't. But he wasn't what they were doing in leading people astray. That is what he was against, not against them as people. And when judgment came on the whole system, in AD 70, it was the system was being judged, not people. And if those people were following the system, they didn't heed the warning that Jesus gave them to, to get out and leave and follow him. So they suffered the consequences. But it wasn't God wanting to punish them or bring them and kill them. They just chose to stay within the system that was going to come to an end. So they suffered the consequences of that. But it wasn't God's desire to judge people and to kill people. It never is and never will be. So I think we've got to, you know, just carry the right heart towards how we legislate and how we see things, you know, from that perspective and then you know, we can then be looking at legislating in love as God would in God's heart. Yeah. So the yeah. litmus test would be to, uh, God would always try to bless people rather than, you know, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, God is good and God wants to bring good into people's lives, even out of the things they do, which are wrong. He doesn't condone what they do. Because what they do would probably be negative towards them and negative towards other people. And that's not something God would desire. But God wants to bring good. It is the love of Christ that compels us. It's not fear of God's judgment and God's anger. And it's God's love. And that is what we want to have. And I know people, oh, that's all wishy-washy. And, you know, you need to see, well, God is this and God is that, you know. And... Actually, I don't think those people really know who God is, who think God is angry and going to punish people and wants to, you know, kill people and take people out and all of that. You know, God wants people to find their identity as a son of God in relationship with him and find their place, you know, with bringing about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. You know, that's God's desire for everybody. 
And that would be the same for every single person on earth right now. No matter what they've done, Jesus has already died to forgive them for what they've done so that God holds it, doesn't hold it against them at all because they're already reconciled to him. They don't know that. So they're operating at a lost identity. Therefore, they are doing things out of a lack of knowledge and experience of who they are. Now, we've all been there. And I don't want, you know, God didn't judge me in a negative way. He graciously and with mercy and love led me to discovering the truth. He didn't come down and condemn me because I was believing lies. Even though he knew I was believing lies about him and lots of other things. But he led me to experience the truth, which then renewed my mind. So I realized not. I don't believe that anymore. You know, there was no condemnation involved. So we shouldn't condemn people for where they are on their journey. You know, they may still well be operating out of a wrong identity or a wrong way of thinking or religious mindsets, but so were we. So let's have grace and mercy for people and help, help them to find where the truth is, not by condemning them, but by encouraging them to pursue God so they can find the truth in him, in it. You know, um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I think God is love. I know God is love and therefore God operates in love all the time. He never is nothing other than love. And I know people's views of him. Well, he's just and he's holy. Well, of course he is. But that means justice and holiness are love expressed and outworked. They're not, they're not different, you know, and we have this two, two versions of God when we look at, well, the God who seemed to be operating in the Old Testament, as opposed to when Jesus came to reveal who God was in the new. And people are still operating in a mixture of those two faced gods. Well, God isn't. God has always been love. He's never, ever been anything different. And he wasn't operating anything different in the new test old testament as he was in the new it's just people viewed him differently they didn't know him and therefore they viewed him and described him out of their lack of knowledge of him through their own religious mindset of who they created god to be because they rejected a relationship with him and therefore were describing him from a distance through their own mindsets and belief systems about him doesn't define him we have never defined god through our theology and our beliefs or doctrines god is not definable by us he is god therefore just because someone says god is like this or says god is like that or wrote it down and it's recorded in the bible does not mean it's true you know and if it in any way contradicts god is love then we know it's not true because jesus came to reveal who God really was. You don't see Jesus condemning people. He challenged people, but he didn't condemn them and he didn't judge them and he didn't kill them. And even when those who were killing him by putting him on a cross, his response was, Father, forgive them. And that is, that is God. You know, that is what God is. He forgives. He is a loving God. He's been misrepresented by all sorts of religions, including Christianity, to be some someone he isn't. And this is why people need to awaken to love. And they're doing that, a lot of them, by leaving the old conditional nature of who they saw God was within church. And finding God outside of that. And there are people who've never been in church are finding that God is love. Not through that religious thing. But they're still coming through Jesus. Even if they don't name him. Because he is the door to which we can find the Father. You can't find it any other way. But that door is open. It's always been open. Jesus is the door. He has opened the way to the Father. And he is not as precious about the, how people come through that door to find the father as we are often. And therefore, when people find the father, they will have come through Jesus, the son. They may not name that way, 
but that is the way the door to the father is open and jesus has kept it open you know so we need to help people come through that door to find him and to experience that they're the love of god and the identity that they have in god themselves and not try and you know conform them to some religious way of doing it you know because more people are finding god and finding god's love outside of christianity as are in it you know um you know i'm not against people finding jesus and coming through accepting what jesus did on the cross at all and that's how i would present the gospel to people and help them to discover who god is in love and to experience that love and realize that jesus loves them and has made a way for them but i would not be prescriptive to say there's no other way that people can come and experience the love of god it was going to be through jesus but it might not be through the religious christian way that we have described how jesus saves people you know people are already saved they're already included they're already reconciled they're already accepted they're already forgiven they don't know that and our way of presenting the good news may not help them know that yeah, let's help them find god and let god bring them into the relationship and reveal that to them you know it's not our responsibility to do that that's god's let's help people and let's remove all the hindrances and obstacles that may have been put in their way which have stopped them coming to find god you know which is the you know harsh judgmental you're going to be condemned to hell if you don't accept jesus message which is not true you know i mean it is it is powerful that love never fails and love never gives up and death is not the end of choice for people even if they do choose to reject jesus in this life and not accept god in this life god does not reject them and there is opportunity for them to embrace god beyond that life you know and actually i mean i've I've a testimony about that which you know i've never done this before but you know, a week or so ago i think it was last week i um i went to a celebration of someone's life and this was a a, a guy that i met through sort of a school reunion type thing and he was the husband of the wife of one of debbie's school friends and we were meeting every few months or every probably three months i suppose uh, as she got together and i got to know him and i got to know the husbands because the uh, the husbands are a bit spare part at you know school reunions for their wives you know we're like oh, well what are we supposed to talk about you know we we don't know each other so yeah and i got to know them and one of the guys is a christian and and i've helped him engage grace and love and the mystic side of things great we've had great conversations this other guy he really wasn't interested at all nice guy you know funny and whatever and we we met in in april and in june we heard that he'd been diagnosed with a disease and then he died in july you know suddenly you know really quickly um sad for his wife and for family and children and we were invited to go to the celebration of his life which was totally non-religious because he was totally against organized religion as i found out when people were telling stories about him and everything else and I sat there listening to the stories and people's recollections. And what I felt, I started to feel sad. And I started to feel sad, A, for the people who didn't seem to have any hope of where he was and he's dead and gone. And that was his view. Life after death didn't exist as far as he was concerned. And, you know, probably maybe that's what this family feel too. So they didn't have any hope of ever seeing him again or any of that. And I started to feel quite sad about it. And I sort of like, they were playing some music that he liked, some Beatles music and different things. And while they were playing this song, I thought, okay, God, is there anything I can do about this? You know, is there anything that you want me to do about it? And then God, I felt God say, well, you know what to do about it. So I thought, oh, can I? Yeah. So I thought, okay, 
I'm going to be bold. So I, while, while everyone was quiet and while the music was playing, I went to the fire of God's love and I called him out. You know, and I didn't know whether he was going to be there because sometimes people accept Jesus on their deathbed and whatever. But he was there and he came forth and, you know, I felt, you know, the emotion and I felt he was feeling condemned, not by God, but by self-condemnation and self-anguish because he realized that his belief systems weren't right because he was still alive. He wasn't dead. You know, his consciousness is still living. So or it's a shock for people who don't believe there's any life after death when they die and they find out they're still alive. And then it's like, ah, so I've preached the gospel to him. I preached God's love never fails that even though he'd rejected God while he lived and didn't accept that there was a God that God still loved him and God had never rejected him and God still loved him. And he wanted a relationship with him. And I preached and shared that good news and, and offered him that opportunity to which he accepted and he followed me and I introduced him to the father and the father brought his spirit and soul back together and unified him and gave him new clothes of glory and a ring on his finger of sonship and it was just wonderful just to see feel now I didn't get up and tell people what I'd done they would have probably all thought I was very weird because that wasn't the framework for the meeting. But now he has a relationship with God. And death is not the end. It's just a, another opportunity in a different way to experience God's love. You know, and I know people will say, yeah, you can't talk to dead people. Well, they're not dead. People's spirit and soul don't die. Their body might be dead, but they're moved into another realm. And we still have an opportunity of sharing the good news with them if they have chosen to reject Jesus and God in this life. And then I started to feel really happy, you know, in the sense of now the joy that this guy felt. You know, now then hopefully, of course, I would want his children and his friends to feel the same joy. You know, and that they would be awakened to God's love. You know, but at least for him. He's now out of the consuming fire and the refining process he's in, and he is accepting God's love. And now he knows who he is. And now he's going to go on to fulfill his destiny in that realm, um, which is good news, you know. Um, and so, yeah, this, these, these are tremendous opportunities of sharing God's love. You know, death is definitely not the end of choice. In And as I, you know, experienced in that that testimony you know no i'm not saying i'll ever do that again i don't know you know it, it, i felt moved by compassion and god gave me permission so i did um you know i might not be in a position of going to another person's thing like that but all of us have the opportunity to be able to preach the good news and to help people embrace you know god's love even after they die and you know it's an opportunity that each of us has and there may be family members you know i mean you know i've shared stories before of what i've done in that area um but this was done in a slightly different way um and you know in one sense i was quite surprised that i even thought about it but actually i was just feeling so moved that there was so much missing from this that could have been you know so i thought well okay let's go and do something about it and then, of course, he still had the choice to say, hey, I'm not believing that, whatever. But, you know, his belief system had already been challenged because he didn't think there was anything after death. So, you know, but people have the conditioning to what that means. So he thought he was condemned to stay there forever. Because he didn't know any different. And that even though he didn't believe in God and he didn't believe in death and he definitely didn't believe in hell, you know, he was now in a place where he thought that's what it must be. And he thought that that's where he was going to be. And he was full of self anguish that his decisions in life had placed him there. But God still loves him and the love of God can still meet people in that place. And it's our responsibility to empty that place of people, making sure that no one's left there and they all find the love of God. Yeah. 
Oh, this is equally important, uh, Mike, that people who pass beyond mm -hmm. are still stuck. How long would they be stuck if no one intervened? Well, I'm not sure time has the same relevance okay. as it is here. So they may live in a perpetual moment of what they're feeling, or it feels like there's process, though, because God's love is refining and purifying in whatever way that is to remove every objection that they might have, including their own belief systems, so that eventually they make the choice. We can't force them. God doesn't force them, but he doesn't stop loving them. But he's included us in the process to be able to share the good news with people even after death. But how would they make a choice if they don't, don't have a grid of reference that there is something else? That um, I well, I think that's why we need to go there and preach the gospel. But there's, but Jesus might do something himself. I don't know. Okay. You know, in a sense, it's like God loves them. So God is at work in their lives. He's looking to refine and purify in the fire of his love so that they do experience his love. And, you know, God's capable of doing that in any way he chooses to do it. But he is in he has called us to participate with him in sharing the good news with people, whether here on earth or beyond in death. So, you know, God is merciful and kind and loving. So I don't think people is like, oh, they're going to spend five billion years there or something, because I don't think time operates in the same way as it does here in that time scale. But there are still process, you know, going on, whichever way that works. And I don't know, to be honest, you know, I don't know how time works there, whether they're kept in sort of sort of a perpetual point where at any point something can change and their minds can change. And, you know, what I know is God's love doesn't fail and God's love continues to outwork in their lives to bring about that point where they will accept him. But he won't force them. But he will do whatever is necessary and he will inspire us, hopefully, to do it. You know, which is why, you know, I felt moved. If I didn't feel moved and I just sat there, we're like, OK, oh, OK, it's just happened in his life and I celebrate his life, but not think about him. I started to think about him and I started to think about the lack of hope that people had because of his belief system for him. And I thought, well, I don't have to be subject to lack of hope. I know there's hope. So I felt moved to go and talk to God about it. And he certainly gave me permission to go and engage. Mike, at that point, when he, he met the father and accepted, mm. realized uh, what God accepted, what God had done for him, is mm. that the point at which he would enter God's and become part of God's pure light of perfection? Well, what figuratively what happens is that the father embraces him, brings his spirit and soul back into union, and clothes them with his identity and relationship in sonship and then he will go on to a process of maturity because he doesn't know anything he doesn't he knows even less than we do now some things that might be a good thing because he doesn't have to get rid of all the religious baggage because he didn't believe any of it but there's still cultural stuff that is in the mind that you knows and he needs to get to know how loving god is and and who he is now from that perspective you know, so I definitely feel, yeah, you know, whatever happens, there's a sense where there is this relational connection that takes place, both with his spirit and soul. Because remember, his spirit and soul were disconnected the whole of his life. And now God brings the spirit and soul back together. He has a heavenly body, whatever that is. Yeah, and then he then begins to operate in relationship and goes on a process of maturing in relationship. Now, whether he will get training by cloud of witnesses or angelic, I don't know. You know, in a sense, that's up to how God deals with the ongoing thing. But it was a joy to see the joy he had on his face and 
how when God hugged him and God embraced him and there was this sort of restoration that took place in his in his being you know and you something happens at that moment that brings about a reunion between spirit and soul to which then he can ongoingly then experience whatever it is that God asked for him and find that he has a purpose because he's now part of the cloud of witnesses and he's more aware of obvious who he is and obviously God yeah. Mike yeah. my understand and I probably don't understand this but my spirit is my connection with God my soul is my connection through my spirit with this realm on earth but when he reconnects my spirit and soul like the place he would be in the other realm what is the, what is the purpose of the soul well the soul and, is the soul is the memories and the personality and the person that God designed him to be and the choice that he has within that to express that love to God. You know, you can't express love to God other than by choice. And the soul is the expression and seat of our emotions that enables us to love God and feel loved by God. So it, so the spirit and the soul together bring us into a wholeness of a union that when we discover what God has done for us and we come into a revelation of that, then we go through a process of where our spirit and soul become in union and our soul comes to a point of surrendering God, which is choice. And it's the choice that we still have and when we are united and we are united by God, obviously we're then not hindered by all of the negative stuff because the memory of that point is a restoration and a healing and a bringing into wholeness that deals with our past. So, you know, when it says, you know, there will be no, every tear will be wiped from our eye and all of that, that happens at that moment. There's a sense where all of the baggage we carry, God brings forgiveness and healing and wholeness into. So we carry none of the negative towards it, but we carry the wisdom that we have through the process. So he would be one of the cloud of witnesses that would be really good to go and testify to other people in the fire of this is what I was like also. I didn't believe in God and look what's happened to me. The grace of God, like, you know, amazing grace. You know, and I have asked people who have a testimony of amazing grace to accompany me into the fire of God's love, to share their testimony with others who just don't think it's possible or think it's too good to be true or whatever or they're too bad and feeling such shame that they don't feel that they could even be worthy that god loved them that those testimonies of god's amazing grace are powerful when they're able to share them with others who are stuck in that fiery place you know so you know god will use that so the memory is not removed but the negativity of the memory is removed because it's now clothed in mercy and love and grace. So, you know, when I've engaged the cloud of witnesses, it's like I've not felt that they are carrying the negative memories of the past, but they do have the wisdom associated with it. So David is recognized as a man after God's own heart. Well, we know David committed some pretty difficult, bad stuff, but that doesn't seem to be condemning him because it's clothed with mercy and he knows he's forgiven. So the so the the way in which our memory operates doesn't carry any condemnation, guilt or shame with it. So all of that gets dealt with at that moment. And so you're so really we're a spiritual being with our soul being our choice well our soul is a is a spiritual in other words we're created our spirit is our, our spirit is part of god is it not 
Our are we? Spirit, yeah, because we're created for it. Pre-existed and existed and cr was created to carry our identity. The spirit and soul are separated because of man's independent choice to follow their own path. And when we discover that we are accepted and we enter into it, our spirit and soul come back into a union. But there's often a tension at that point because the soul, our personality, our history, our choices, our mindsets, our belief systems has ruled our life, the whole of our life, until we come to the point where we realize, wow, I'm, I've found God and God loves me. But then you still have to go through the renewal of the mind and the process of renewing of the mind here for us to accept what is true and so that we no longer are operating out of our choice independently of god that's what got us in the problem in the first place so we have come to the point eventually of surrendering so i surrendered my right to choose i didn't want the choice anymore now of course i still choose but i'm choosing not out of the negativity of it my choice is I'm a daily, I'm a living sacrifice. I am in a relationship with God in which he loves me unconditionally. So I know and I have had a revelation and that knowledge has brought me into a different place than when I was, when I first, quote, became a Christian, my soul was still operating. Even though I, I met God and I knew I'd sort of met God, you know, in limitation, I could do that from an evangelical position i was in then but i i knew that god loved me but i didn't really know what love meant um but i knew the bible said god loved me and i knew that i'd been forgiven and all of that but my soul was still ruling my life and i hadn't surrendered to god you know it's this thing about well you find jesus and then jesus becomes lord and then jesus becomes lord again and again and again as you surrender all the stuff that he isn't lord of you know and ultimately that's a process and a journey of discovering who god is and who we are from that perspective and on that journey we learn to make choices aligned to god's heart rather than out of our previous understanding um and so yes i think yeah, the Bible describes it as a spirit wrestling against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. That is just our right to choose. Now, God doesn't remove our right to choose, but he wants us to surrender our right to choose independently of him. And I chose that surrendering. That caused the separation of my soul and spirit and the reintegration of my soul and spirit. So my soul was no longer operating independently. And I think that's the key, you know. I, my soul and spirit, I were, became unified and one. And I was no longer operating purely out of my soul's choice because I surrendered my soul's choice to operate out of in, in the union where my spirit in relationship and union with God directed the guided my choices. And Jesus chose only to do what he saw the father doing. He wasn't forced because he had already surrendered into that relationship to the father because he and the father were one in a sense so it's definitely a um a, an ongoing process for us here and i would assume maybe it's an ongoing process for them there i don't know because that's you know it's, it's not my testimony to give so i wouldn't we'd need to ask somebody who had gone through that process of coming out of the fire into god's love and see what happened to them you know and maybe it's a mystery that we're not supposed to know you know you know i don't profess to need to know everything um you know um so yeah it's just there are mysteries and sometimes i think it's good there are mysteries <laughs> you know then i don't have to try and figure it all out and understand it all but i trust god is good i don't know what god will do is always going to be based in love I don't know why God made it so difficult to find our lost identity. Well, he didn't find, he didn't find, make it difficult. We chose independence and therefore the consequences of our independence are that we have to come and choose not to be independent. We're not forced. 
that that is why there's choice i don't believe in free will because there's something that influences our will but our influence our will can be influenced by god or it can be influenced by our past so when i chose to surrender my free will because i said to god i don't want a free will i want you to influence my will and therefore my choice because i realized that my choices were not actually doing me any good because i based my choices out of my history and what i'd learned now i could make some good choices but i could also make a lot of bad choices so what i did was okay what's the best thing here well, I choose to surrender my right to choose and I choose only to want to choose the things which are aligned for your heart for me. You know, and the renewing of the mind is a process. It's not a it's not a instant reprogramming of our mind because our mind, which is part of our soul, has been conformed to the world in which we've lived and jesus wants to bring us into a true relationship with god and with ourselves and paul very clearly says you know do not be conformed to this world do not be pressed into this mold actually be transformed metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind into who you really are so it is you know and it's not enough to say oh you're this person you've got to experience it otherwise it would just be another belief system about who i am i need to know who i am and i can only know who i am in relationship to him who reveals who i am in relationship and that is what was missing we didn't have a relationship within the soul with god therefore we came to our own assumptions and understanding through how we were brought up, nurtured, taught, went through, whether we were in church or whatever. We learned things culturally from the environment we were in. A lot of what we learned wasn't true. So we have to embrace what is true to reveal that truth so that then we no longer believe the things we did you know and god is not trying to make that difficult but there's a journey and a process to be had god walked with adam in the in the garden in the cool of the day he wants to walk with us in that journey because it is a relational unveiling of it uh, it doesn't it's not a okay i'm being plugged into the matrix and now i can have a download of how to do kung fu you know it's like oh i can do kung fu because it's downloaded there's no relationship in that so when neo in the matrix story met the oracle the relationship with the oracle was to help him reveal who he truly was if she just told him he wouldn't have believed it anyway so she let him find it out as the story unfolded and that is how god wants us to discover the truth is to find the truth relationally as we outwork that journey with him you know which is why it isn't instant and it's just not a makeover that we can just have without the relational process that goes in and each of us started with a negative you know i started on minus 100 in my fatherhood relationship so all of that had to be healed and restored and made whole to bring me back to zero. I'd never been fathered. So God healed me of my father wounds to bring me back to a point where now I would allow him to father me. And we've all got different things in our lives that complicate and make up the soul and the memories and the experiences and the trauma and all the things we've gone through that God needs to heal and make whole as we allow him to do it. Because we still have to surrender to him and allow him to do it so that, that process can go on relationally. And that's not easy because sometimes our soul, you know, we do have a strong will and we do have a self-righteous belief system and we do don't like to be proved wrong. So we defend our position and all of that is the soul and how independence in the soul 
has shaped our personality and how we cope with life and respond to situations. And we're all different. Therefore, all our journey is different into how we will be restored. But God's desire is to restore us back to full wholeness, spirit, soul, body, so that we will truly understand our full identity and who we were, which will then transform how we see ourselves and feel about ourselves from that mind and belief. Um, and as we journey it through, we discover more and more how wonderful God is and how loving he is. And we trust him more. Most people don't trust because of the pain the soul has gone through. Therefore, we've got to find healing in the soul to be able to trust. You know, I said I trusted God. But I did up to a point. And then I realized I didn't. So I had to surrender to trust him. That was not an easy thing. And eventually when I did, oh, it was such a transformation, such a change. Not to have to do this myself anymore. And to validate myself and to be performing to validate myself, I just accepted who he said I was. And it was such a joyful thing. That didn't mean instantly I knew everything. I still had to go through deconstruction, but I trusted God in the deconstruction process, which was, you know, a relational thing, which took me deeper and deeper into intimacy to which I trusted God. And therefore he was able to take me through really difficult things because I trusted that he's good. Yeah, and I know he's good and I know he loves me unconditionally. So that frees me to allow him to do what he wants to do in my life. And I cooperate with him in the process you know, rather than resisting him. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.